Multi-platinum LA rockers Motley Crue rose to fame with their debauchery-fueled brand of heavy metal that enthralled readers around the world with The Dirt, a hit memoir that made its way to Netflix in 2019. Here's all the dirt behind The Dirt, on the page and on the screen. Compared to other rock biography books, The Dirt just has a lot more. It's got more stories of illegal activity and heavy metal debauchery, and it's also got a lot of authors. Five guys are credited on the cover. Motley Crue band members Vince Neil, Nikki Six, Mick Mars, and Tommy Lee, along with Neil Strauss. He's the guy who did all the interviewing and assembled a coherent narrative out of what must have been stacks of tapes and copious notes culled from following around four guys for months. Strauss first hooked up with Motley Crue in 1998, when he briefly toured with the band for a profile and spin. At the time, he was finalizing his Marilyn Manson book, The Long Hard Road Out of Hell, and the crew members who read it loved it. When publisher HarperCollins contracted the group for a book later on, they immediately asked Strauss to helm the project. Once more, he went on tour with Motley Crue and visited each musician at home. Probably the hardest part for him to write? Vince Neil's account of his four-year-old daughter's ultimately tragic battle with cancer. Strauss told MTV, He was crying, I was crying, it tore me apart. When I gave him the book, I said, You might not want to read this. The Dirt manages to top most every other rock biography with its sheer volume of nauseating and unbelievably tall tales. While Hammer of the Gods breathlessly describes every despicable and disgusting act ever committed by the members of Led Zeppelin, it can't compare with Vince Neil's egg burrito story from The Dirt. The Motley Crue singer discusses the band's good old days, its early years as a band playing LA's Rainbow Club by night and using drummer Tommy Lee's Chevy van as a party truck later at night. So this is the party truck, huh? You found it," said Vince Neil. After the rainbow each night, we'd walk to Santa Monica Boulevard, where all the young rockers and actors who never made it were pimping themselves. And then, even if they had girlfriends at the time, they'd entertain any girls who wanted to get into Tommy's van. Afterwards, the crew would scrounge up enough money to buy a breakfast burrito from a local establishment. Then, each member of the band would place their genitals, quote, into the warm meat to cover up the smell of the women who had been there earlier. Why? In their words, so that our girlfriends didn't know. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, kinda? While The Dirt reveals one brazen display of Caligula-like excess after another, the book goes a bit beyond the drug-taking and exploits. For instance, in the mid-1980s, the band's rep sought to protect its investment and made every member of the drink-and-drug-addled group get clean. Guitarist Mick Mars recounted, Our management was trying to do some kind of extensive plastic surgery on the band, and we had to see all these doctors who would try to brainwash us into behaving differently. Once a week, we'd have to go to relationship counseling like an old bitter married couple. There, we'd learn how to talk to each other instead of fighting, or we'd discuss our feelings and whatever was going on that week. Mars resented all of that, especially since he'd kicked his habits without any formal help, but it was the waterworks that really irked him. He said, Every therapist wanted us to let loose and cry, and I hate crybabies. I became so sick of seeing everyone in the band bawling their eyes out. You want to know what rehab was really like? Feelings and crying and apologies. December 8, 1984 looms dark in rock history. That's when an intoxicated Vince Neil drove himself and Hanoi rock drummer Nicholas Razzle Dingley to a liquor store to get more booze for a multi-day party. Neil lost control on a winding road and smashed into another car, instantly killing his passenger. The Dirt tells this horrific story, but it also reveals that a few hours before that tragedy, another sad and shocking event nearly befell the group. Neil says that he woke up that afternoon to see something on the beach, which he described as a small black whale. Upon examination, it was Mick Mars, passed out in the sand in black leather from head to toe. What did Neil do? Nothing. Neil wrote, He mumbled something about just wanting to be left lying there, so I left him there, looking like E.T. when he was sick. After dark, Mars regained consciousness, but he was sure he was dead and was now a ghost, and instinctively headed toward a glow of light coming from the distance. It was Neil's house, where the party had turned sad and silent. Mars explained, I figured that they were crying for me, that I had drowned in the water and they had discovered my body. According to band manager Doug Thaler in The Dirt, Vince Neil's self-sabotaging behavior in the early 90s threatened his position in Motley Crue. By February 1992, bassist Nikki Six was over it. During a major rainstorm that flooded large parts of LA, each member made the treacherous journey to the studio, but not Neil. After waiting for Neil for hours, the band's tour manager faxed the singer, telling him to show up ASAP. 
Neal then called, explaining that he hadn't done so already because the phone lines were down. According to Six, by the time he arrived, the seed was already planted in our minds that he was holding us back. Neal finally arrived, soaked and sulking. Six casually mentioned that the band was considering new lead singer talks, while Neal retorted that the reason he'd skipped rehearsals was because he thought the album was dumb. After more bickering, Neal left in a huff. Six wrote, He says he was fired. I say he quit. After the huge sales of the 1989 album Dr. Feelgood, Elektra Records was eager to stay in the Motley Crue business, and in 1991 gave the band a $25 million contract. But the band's future remained shaky. With Neil gone, the group recruited singer John Karabi. According to Thaler, the record the new crew recorded took up 14 months and $2 million in studio costs. All that for a relative dud. Released in March 1994, Motley Crue debuted at number 7 on the Billboard 200. Then the album fell to 28 in its second week. The supporting tour was a similar disaster. Nikki Six recalled that at the first stop in Tucson, Arizona, only 4,000 tickets had been sold for a 15,000-seat amphitheater. He tried to give tickets away at a radio station, and only two people showed up. What happened? Rock drastically changed between Dr. Feelgood and 1994. The LA hair metal sound was out. Grunge and alternative rock were in. Motley Crue was old news in the 90s, with the low sales of Motley Crue surpassed by even lower sales of its 1997 follow-up, the Vince Neil reunion record Generation Swine. There was nowhere to go but up, and rather than chase trends, Motley Crue embraced what fans wanted them to be, degenerate party monsters. And they did it not with an album or tour or even a reality show, they did it with The Dirt. Not only did literate music fans come to expect a certain amount of sordid detail and rock memoirs in the wake of The Dirt, but it spawned a cottage industry in Motley Crue books. The success of The Dirt inspired Tommy Lee and Vince Neil to go solo with their own individual memoirs. Tommy Land and Tattoos and Tequila, respectively, while Nikki Six cleaned up the journals he wrote during the depths of his drug addiction to create the Heroin Diaries. Musicians take inspiration from wherever they can. Nikki Six, always Motley Crue's most dominant and prolific songwriter, took that idea to heart, even if things got a little too inception y along the way. The dirt dredged up so many memories for Six and his bandmates, some bad, mostly good, that they got back together with departed drummer Tommy Lee to record a brand new album with the original lineup for the first time in more than a decade. That record? 2008's Saints of Los Angeles. And while many Motley Crue songs are based on actual experiences in Six's life, Saints is loosely based on The Dirt. In other words, it's the musical version of a book that's about himself and the other members of Motley Crue. In fact, the LP was almost actually named The Dirt. That makes any sense. Probably doesn't, but that's because I'm half nuts anyway, so it's okay. The Dirt first thrilled readers and rocked its way to the New York Times bestseller list back in 2001, and the film version didn't make its Netflix debut until 2019. That's a long time between source material and adaptation, but it's not because nobody was trying. A film version of The Dirt could have hit movie screens in late 2006 or early 2007. That's when Paramount Classics forged an agreement to make the movie with MTV Films. Things got as far as a table read of the script in 2014, but then Focus Features brought the project back from the dead in 2015, with Jackass veteran Jeff Tremaine already attached as a director. Even once Netflix acquired the rights to the movie version of The Dirt, it took a full two years years to get the thing finished. Playing a rock star must be fun for actors. They get to live out their wildest rock star fantasies, and awards consideration is often part of the conversation. In the past two decades, a number of acclaimed actors have won Oscars for portraying real-life musical icons. But when The Dirt finally got made, filmmakers went with a cast made up largely of performers who aren't quite household names, such as Game of Thrones star Ewan Rayon as Mick Mars and Douglas Booth as Nikki Six. Over the years, a number of much bigger stars were pursued or attached to the project. Project. In 2007, Vince Neil announced at the opening of his Las Vegas tattoo parlor that the legendary Christopher Walken had signed on to play the legendary Ozzy Osbourne, while Val Kilmer was a go for a cameo as David Lee Roth. None of those choices worked out, obviously. In both the book and film adaptations of The Dirt, cheating death is a major recurring theme. 
Vince Neil walked away from a drunk driving accident that killed his passenger, Mick Mars thought he died on a beach one day, and Nikki Six recalled the time he actually was dead for a few minutes. It would seem that the theme extended to the making of the film adaptation of The Dirt. During production in New Orleans in March 2018, a member of the film's crew was de-rigging a set when one of the electrical components delivered a nasty shock. A rep for the film told The Hollywood Reporter, even though all of our safety protocols were in place, an accident did occur and a crew member was injured by electricity. Filming wasn't interrupted because the cast was off shooting somewhere else while this ill-fated de-rigger was tearing down a set that was no longer needed. EMTs took him to a nearby hospital where he was listed in stable condition and recovered. No word on who will be the next victim of the curse of the crew, but you should probably stay far, far away from Tommy Lee, just in case. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite musicians are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.